Hey everyone, uh, this is the Ancient Rome class at Flagler College. Um, so in this video, uh, I want to discuss, um, at least start discussing, the society of Rome in the imperial period, and specifically we're talking about the 1st and 2nd centuries here. Um, let me bring in some conversation about the 3rd century a little bit. Uh, and so I'll stretch this over a couple of videos. Um, in the next one, uh, I will discuss some of the assigned texts for this week, and so the, um, uh, the Pliny the Younger um, letters, uh, the, the Tacitus reading, um, and uh, so forth and so on, um, which have great information in them about the society of Rome, um, as does, for that matter, the Apuleius text, which is what you have to write a paper about. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're thinking about uh, a number of issues, and I encourage you as you as you uh, consider what to write that Apuleius paper on. This is not one that has a prompt. Um, this is one where you need to uh, come up with your own question to ask uh, of that text, uh, your own kind of theme or issue to explore. Um, there are several things that I'll mention in this lecture that um, uh, ought to well, spark your creativity um, that you might think about. And I'll try to draw reference directly to Apuleius a little bit uh, over the next couple of videos. Um, the economy of the Pax Romana uh, was complex um, and varied. Uh, just a few points about that that um, were brought up in the readings. Um, uh, for one, Rome did dominate the trade in luxury goods, not only in the Mediterranean, obviously, but this tied Rome into the larger world economy. Um, uh, Rome, uh, with its great wealth, uh, gleaned from taxation and from conquest and things like this, developed a taste for luxury goods, um, and by the imperial period, the Romans had figure out, figured out the um, <clears throat> skills necessary uh, to participate in long-distance trade by, you know, uh, understanding the way that the winds blew in the Indian Ocean and things like this, that, um, you know, this tied Rome into the, the trade in goods coming out of the Indian subcontinent and, and even points beyond, right? And so we find a fair amount of evidence um, of these foreign goods um, that were brought into Rome, and uh, we have to assume then that uh, the wealth of Rome was to some extent uh, exiting the region dominated by Rome, right? Um, and... Uh, you know, this um, this was really good for those who could afford it, right? To have the the kinds of uh, fine goods, um, uh, everything from well, I mean, uh, fine pottery to goods made of glass. Um, even by the you know uh, imperial period, things like porcelain coming out of the east, um, and probably as well as things like spices uh, coming from the Indian Ocean region though not in the, in the quantity that would be later on in the Middle Ages, for instance. Um, but in addition to that, uh, Rome also um, geared a lot of its own economy to the production of luxury goods because these are the things that turn the highest profits. There were factories um, that were constructed in various regions of the empire, um, uh, and goods made of glass, good, goods made, I mean, various pottery goods, um, Things that were in demand, uh, things that are essentially kind of works of art, right, that are mass produced, uh, that were in demand by the Roman elites. Um, and by that, we don't just mean the people of senatorial or equestrian rank in Rome itself. We also mean the local leadership in the provinces, the curiales, uh, the local elites who were trying to imitate the Romans. Um, uh, they bought up these luxury goods. Um, and the wealth of Rome. Uh, traveled in the opposite direction, right? Um, and so this trade in luxury goods really didn't help the common people at all, um, at least not much, right? Um, but there were things in the economy, broadly conceived, that did benefit um, a broad swath of people. And uh, these took the forms of philanthropy and things like public benefactions, and so emperors to ingratiate themselves with the public, would um, not only provide uh, high-quality entertainment, um, ancient Roman style, things like gladiatorial games and, and uh, beast hunts and, and things like this, um, 
but they also uh, built lots of public buildings. They built uh, new aqueducts and roads and bridges and things like this. And so public works um, were largely the product of either emperors or other elites, aristocrats, um, trying to win the favor of the public and to make a name for themselves, to gain honor, that's still a thing, um, although it's more and more closely tied to the emperor, um, but to gain honor and reputation by, you know, building a, uh, building a new temple um, dedicated to a specific god or building a, a school somewhere um, and, and maybe even providing the uh, school fees for um, children who couldn't afford it. Uh, perhaps the, you know, the, um, the children of a, of a village or a neighborhood in Rome that uh, the benefactor was closely tied to or had a commitment to in some way, right? Um, and so, you know, the Romans did participate in a lot of philanthropy. Um, this was not perhaps for the same reason that um, modern, <clears throat> modern philanthropists would do this, although maybe, maybe it is. Um, but uh, it was to um, win popularity uh, with, the, uh, with the populace as much as they could. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's how a lot of Rome and uh, not just the city of Rome, but the, uh, the Roman Empire, all of the great monumental works and things like this that still populate the European landscape. Uh, this is one of the major factors in the construction of that landscape. Um, that said, nearly every Roman, with very few exceptions, though not this isn't certainly an equal thing, uh, but nearly every Roman uh, had to pay some kind of tax. Um, uh, there were s different kinds, and so in Italy, uh, direct taxation, which would be in the form of um, uh, like a head tax and sometimes uh, a property tax of some sort. Um, there were actually different, uh, different kinds of direct taxation. Um, and uh, so nearly everyone had to pay that, um, uh, except in Italy itself, right? So in the provinces, this was a standard thing. Uh, every person owed their dues of taxes. And in the provinces, this included, in most cases, even Roman citizens, except in some place where they might be exempt, like, um, you know, military veterans who had been settled in a colony somewhere would often be exempted from direct taxation. But everyone, including people in the city, and probably even including aristocrats who, uh, you know, made the rules about taxes, had to pay things like sales tax and customs taxes. Um, a tax was placed on manumission of slaves, which is kind of interesting and kind of appalling at the same time. Um, many elites, Augustus Caesar himself, uh, spoke out against the um, too common manumission of slaves. I think he was worried that uh, if too many slaves were freed, that the empire wasn't going to have enough people to do the manual labor um, that was necessary. Um, and this, of course, being a very different time with different conceptions of slavery, right? So we have we, we may not be surprised by that, even if we find it appalling. Um, uh, but yeah, taxation was, was quite constant. Um, it was not as high, perhaps, at least in many areas of the empire, as mod as taxes are in, say, modern Western countries. Um, uh, but everyone felt the pinch of this, certainly. And uh, this, you know, under the imperial system, as I mentioned in an earlier video, um, there were procurators in the pay of the emperor who carried out most of the collection of taxes. They also co-opted local officials to serve as publicans um, in, in that process. And these were, you know, sometimes billed as scandalous figures. Uh, um, in the Christian New Testament, for instance, one of the disciples of Jesus, whose name is Matthew, um, is called a publican, which would have meant uh, a kind of local official um, who uh, worked with the Romans in the collection of taxes. And publicans were absolutely despised figures. Um, they were thought to be sellouts and, and uh, you know, working for, the, uh, for their, their taskmasters um, and, moreover, collecting taxation money, which is never a, a popular thing. Think of the reputation that the IRS has, for instance. Um, probably undeserved. These are bureaucrats, after all, right? Uh, just doing their job. But um, uh, in any case, you know, publicans were, were despised. Um, 
it's interesting to uh, that Jesus is is criticized in various New Testament stories um, for dining with publicans, and they place publicans in the same kind of category as they do, you know, people like prostitutes and lepers and others who are the most despised categories of uh, uh, of that society. Um, so we can see the you know, the influence that taxation had on people. Um, now, we've some of this is revealing of the, the social structures of the period of the Pax Romana, um, but let me make a few more comments about that. Uh, first of all, there is a pretty strict rural-urban divide um, in ancient Rome. Um, and I don't just, again, don't just mean the city of Rome, I mean the entire empire. Um, while the largest efforts were devoted to improving cities, um, and cities were where power was wielded, you know, uh, the most public funding went to cities. This is where things like temples and monuments and aqueducts and, you know, all of these uh, public benefactions uh, and public works went. Um, but only about maybe 10% of the entire population of the Roman Empire which probably in the second century reached somewhere around 100 million people. Probably only about 10% of them lived in cities. The rest of them lived in the countryside, right? And what was life like for them? Well, um, uh, it varied over time, um, but for the most part in the imperial period, uh, the elites, whether we're talking about the senatorial and equestrian elites of Italy itself or the provincial elites in other parts of the Roman Empire, uh, these elites held the vast majority of land, um, and they otherwise they controlled the countryside in other ways as well. Um, uh, on their huge land holdings, they uh, participated in sharecropping. That is, they leased out parts of their land holdings to tenant farmers. Um, the, the Latin word for this, actually, there are several of these, but the most common one is the word colonus which uh, is actually where we get the word colony and colonize and, and such things. Uh, but colony meant mostly tenant farmers, um, sharecroppers. And they paid uh, a hefty portion of their produce to the landholder in exchange for working um, his land. Um, and it usually is a his, although there are some female landholders. Um, and, uh, you know, life was difficult for people in the provinces. We do get some hints about this in texts like, for instance, Apuleius is the golden ass. Um, he describes conditions in the countryside, at least a little bit. Um, and he, in particular, devotes time to talking about the plight of slaves. Um, there were lots of slaves, millions of slaves in the Roman Empire. Um, and, you know, those who served in elite households in the city, um, were pro their lives were probably um, not a far cry from, you know, the, uh, the kind of stereotypical life that we read about of, uh, you know, the, uh, the slave characters in the comedies of Plautus and Terence, even though this is, you know, two, three centuries beyond that. Um, I mean, they, you know, interacted with their owners, their masters, uh, frequently and probably were accorded special privileges, whereas, you know, I mean, there's that, uh, there's that scene at the beginning of The Haunted House by Plautus where, you know, the country slave is coming to talk to the city slave and, and uh, the two of them do not like each other at all and, the, you know, the country slave um, seems to have a much harder life um, subjected to crueler treatment and uh, to a far more demeaning existence, um, lots more manual labor and things like that than the city slave. And so even with slavery, we see this rural-urban divide. Um, pay attention to the trope or the topic of slavery in Apuleius and in these other texts. I think you'll find it um, uh, revealing. Um, uh, and we, you know, we've said a fair amount about slavery in Rome uh, already. Um, the one thing that we will that we should say is that in the imperial period um, there is this trend toward manumission, um, much to the chagrin of public officials who worried about this. Like as I said, Augustus Caesar, um, slaves tended to be freed not because there was this groundswell of uh, kind of compassion for slaves, 
though there is some of that, and you know there there are ethical or moral or even religious um, sources that uh, you know decry the conditions that uh, slavery places on people. Um, but uh, this was often just good business. Um, if a slave owner uh, manumitted his slaves, he could then turn around and, and uh, force them to pay rent to him as, as sharecroppers, um, thus putting a lot more of the onus to raise money um, on the slaves rather than, you know, having to, and the slaves would then be responsible for their own upkeep and, and obtaining their own food and things like this. Um, and so this was often just considered good business at this point in time. One of the things we find in, in some of these sources, and, and uh, this impinges upon the religious existence of the, the empire, which I want to talk about in the next video, um, and you know that's, that's also something that appears in great detail in, um, in Apuleius in particular, um, but uh, there were lots of organizations in the ancient Roman period, um, and this was true in Rome, this was true in... Uh, uh, in the provinces, um, and the powers that be, the emperors and others, worried about this, right? They talk about the the danger of so-called societies. Um, we see this in the uh, letters of Pliny the Younger to Trajan, where he, you know, at one point um, asks the emperor if he can start a fire brigade, because there was a fire that broke out in the city of Nicomedia, which was his kind of provincial capital, um, and ended up consuming many buildings, both uh, private and public, uh, in that city. And he said, look, if we had had a, a well-organized fire brigade, then this wouldn't have happened. Can we please start one? And the emperor writes back and says, no, you, you can't, um, because it doesn't matter uh, how these things start out or what title they have or what responsibilities they're given. If we allow people to form a society that quickly is going to uh, become a hotbed for dissent. People are going to, you know, get together and start talking about how discontented they are with Roman rule, and pretty soon we're going to have a political faction that threatens our rule and our ability to keep order, um, and we simply can't have this. He tells Pliny to provide uh, equipment for putting out fires and um, making make this publicly available and encourage those whose Houses, uh, sorry for the yawn. Houses and other buildings are in the path of the fire to to use that equipment, right? Um, uh, and so, but we can't allow any society, even if it seems to be for a good purpose. This is going to be problematic, and you know, um, this is especially true. Meaning the the existence of societies is especially true uh, in the uh, imperial periods um, with the growth of these. Religious cults, um, uh, the mystery religions of uh, goddess, uh, gods and goddesses like Isis and Mithras, um, uh, and uh, even you know Dionysus or Bacchus to some extent, as well as a few others. Uh, these become tremendously popular, and you know we talk in in the next lecture. Uh, I'll go into a bit more detail about those. Um, but on the other hand. Uh, the Romans did not have a huge bureaucracy. The central government of Rome was comparatively, and by comparatively I mean compared to, say, modern nations, tiny. We're talking about, uh, at most, a couple thousand people who are officially part of this, right? The senators, uh, a few hundred of those, and the people of the equestrian order who were often given government commissions to uh, carry out various uh, uh, societal and excuse me economic and, and political functions. Um, but other than that, the Romans relied on local elites in the provinces. And they won their favor and won their loyalty by convincing them that being Roman was the greatest thing they could possibly be. They even sometimes dangled out citizenship as a possible reward for doing great things. And, you know, we see lots of instances of people who are granted citizenship and have the special privilege, even in the kind of far-flung provinces, and have the privileges that go along with that. Um, and so, you know, this is... Uh, uh, 
This is all part of the process of Romanization. Um, but, you know, that is a kind of mask for what was uh, frequently just a demand for free labor on bureaucratic tasks. It was common for the emperor to issue decrees uh, uh, that demanded um, that provincial elites uh, perform these things called liturgies. And by that we mean um, tasks that were uh, for the uh, to ensure the proper running of the government of the provinces, right? Um, things like uh, taking censuses in the provinces, um, uh, taking surveys of um, the land, of water supplies, of uh, the conditions of, of like buildings in the cities and things like this. Um, these were not paid positions, and so Rome did not have, like I said, a, a bureaucracy with officials over uh, overseeing, um, like public utilities, right? Um, there, there was no aqueduct inspector per se uh, in you know the province of Asia or something like that. Um, this was a this tended to be a liturgy, a demand that the central government would make of the provincial elites. And moreover, if there was something wrong with that aqueduct or something wrong with the roads or, you know, if, if uh, money needed to be spent to put these things in good working order, well, the local elites were um, expected to do that themselves. And many local elites wanted to do this or, or were at least willing to do it because this meant winning the favor especially if they did it really well, winning the favor of powerful Romans, possibly even including the emperor himself. It, it's, it, you know, and this perhaps betrays a sense of um, commitment to one's community. Um, that's not out of the realm of possibility, right? If we, uh, in the United States, say, did not have, you know, public officials overseeing things like the water supply or... One thing that always uh, kind of makes me chuckle is uh, every every time I go vote in an election, I have to vote for a mosquito control official, you know, in St. John's County, uh, Florida, right? Because there's so many mosquitoes that we, we actually have to have a paid government position to oversee that. And I totally understand that, right? That's a really important public service. Um, but... Uh, you know, such a thing would have been unthinkable in ancient Rome. Even if they needed something like that, this would have been done by means of these liturgies uh, and handed to provincial elites um, uh, rather than, you know, create a paid government position. The one, the one place where there were paid government positions was in the collection of taxes. And that's, that's the, the main uh, f way that, you know, there, or I should say the main function of a, an official professional government bureaucracy, but these other things, which are important for communities, uh, were not paid, and, and uh, they, were, they were extracted from the population um, who, it seems, at least the uh, elites wanted to prove their loyalty and prove their worth to the empire. Um, we should mention as well, in connection with this, um, the importance of law that the Roman legal system is one of the secrets to their success. Uh, the Romans were relatively obsessed with law. Um, already uh, during the second century, they were carrying out kind of efforts to codify and to organize and systematize the various legal sources that had uh, existed um, all the way back into the Republican period. Um, but especially things like imperial decrees and decisions made by Roman courts in certain cases. Um, these were, you know, being uh, collected and organized and put into a format that could be studied and could be referred to quickly. Um, and, you know, one thing we find in the legal materials is a strict distinction between those who are citizens and those who are not. And that still means something, um, even though, you know, there are a lot of uh, what the Roman government was able to do, they did through local elites who were not always citizens, but to be a citizen gave one special access to certain legal privileges. Um, for instance, they could uh, appeal decisions made by local courts 
um, to and perhaps even go to Rome and have a hearing uh, by a senator or possibly even by the emperor himself. There's a you know one text where this stands out is again the Christian New Testament in the book of Acts, um, where uh, Paul of Tarsus, who's a, a Christian. Um, disciple of Jesus, uh, Christian apostle is one of the words that they used for him, uh, but a leader of, uh, of the Christian movement. Um, he is arrested by Roman officials and the local uh, uh, leadership of Judea despises the guy and they want to put him to death and so they hold this trial and uh, when the sentence is read, Paul then says, I appeal to Caesar. And the Roman official who was kind of overseeing this, or at least making sure this didn't get out of hand, uh, he says, why didn't you tell me you were a Roman citizen? We would have conducted this whole thing very differently if we had known that. And Paul basically said, well, um, I was trying to win the case on its own merits uh, rather than, you know, pull this out. But now, now that it has, you know, now that the uh, local officials have revealed that they are, you know, out for my blood. I am going to exercise my privilege as a Roman citizen and appeal to Caesar. And, you know, then they're like, okay, well, you're going to go to Caesar then. So they load Paul onto a ship in Caesarea. And uh, the last couple of chapters of the book of Acts has him traveling to Rome where he ultimately makes it. Um, and we don't even get the rest of the story to find out what happened with his... Uh, um, with this appeal in Rome or anything like that. Once Paul made it to Rome, the book ends, seemingly because, you know, that that's a common sentiment in the ancient world, that once you've made it to Rome, then you've done everything you can possibly do, right? That's the center of the world, the center of the universe, uh, at least in the imagination of people in this era. Um, Rome was uh, viewed as the home to everyone, whether they were citizens or not. The Romans did have a whole system of law uh, to govern over their far-flung provinces that um, uh, provided certain privileges for all people who were of free status, for instance, but did not extend to them the kinds of privileges that were given to Roman citizens. Um, uh, this uh, system of laws for the provinces is known as the Ius Gentium, um, and this isn't like contained in a single book or anything like that, it's more a body of tradition. Uh, with some texts to back up the precedents and things like this. Um, but that means the law of peoples or the law of nations. Um, and uh, the Romans had a very strong conception of, you know, this, these two um, coexisting and to some extent overlapping systems of laws, uh, the legal system for those who were Roman citizens and the legal system for everyone who lived under Roman rule. Okay, um, I think I've shown you a, a map of the... Uh, kind of the greatest extent of the Roman Empire. Um, this map doesn't necessarily capture a specific moment in time. This just shows you that every, everything that Rome either controlled or uh, had influence in. Um, places like, uh, sorry, let um, me go back to the last slide. Places like, you know, these areas up here in, you know, the southern part of what is now Germany and parts of Austria and Switzerland, these were not necessarily... Um, incorporated fully into Roman territory. Um, Dacia certainly was. And Dacia, as we mentioned last time, was the last large Roman conquest. This is the only area north of the Danube River that becomes fundamentally intertwined with, uh, it becomes a full province, I, I guess we should say. Uh, places like Pannonia and Noricum and Raetia and these um, places that uh, Rome called Germania, right? Um, these were at best tributary states um, under the leadership of local chieftains um, who sometimes paid tribute to Rome but often tried to avoid that. As we mentioned last time, uh, the Romans only controlled Mesopotamia for about a decade or two during the reign of Trajan and maybe a little bit under Hadrian um, and, you know, things like Assyria. I mean, th these were very short-lived experiments with rule over these far-flung far territories. But other places that you might assume are not that important actually kind of are. Um, and so one place that um, uh, becomes pretty fundamental to the Roman economy was the, the province of Arabia Petraea. Um, the Petraea means the city, uh, by, that's a reference to the city of Petra, which had been an independent kingdom of the Nabataean Arab peoples uh, in that region. 
Um, but in the uh, first couple of decades of the second century during the reign of Trajan, this was conquered um, and by, the, by Quietus, who we talked about last time. And uh, this became, you know, a, a Roman province. And Petra was key not only because it has some of the most amazing architecture of any place in the world, um, but because it was a, a, a really important stop on the trade routes that connected the Arabian Peninsula and the Indian Ocean um, to the Mediterranean and to the broader Roman world. And so this is a kind of uh, linkage point to this um, global economy as it existed in the ancient world, right? So, play, I mean, you know, you might think that Rome is all about Italy and maybe about Greece and things like this, but some of these these provinces were really important. Uh, Gaul, for instance, which had been conquered by Caesar, um, Julius Caesar, that is, uh, this uh, was home to a lot of local industry, um, things like the uh, production of pottery and glasswares and other luxury goods. Um, was done in large part in Gaul, and Gaul was divided up into these various territories. Um, uh, and so you know, the provinces became increasingly important, uh, and Rome continued to rule these each in their own way um, because local circumstances were unique, um, but they tried for greater and greater normativity over time, um, though there continued to be you know, client kingdoms and things like this all through the period of the Roman Empire. Um, one of the, I mean, the last kind of theme that I want to talk about in this video um, is the Roman concept of city planning. Um, I mentioned that cities are the centers of government and trade and culture and all of the things that the Romans considered important, even though Rome was, uh, by any kind of demographic measurable, not a very urbanized place. Um, there were significant cities. And every province had its had a provincial capital and maybe a, a few important cities in it. Um, and uh, you know the the processes that define Roman society, politics, and economy, as well as culture, uh, happened in the cities. This the cities were perhaps the greatest catalyst in the process of Romanization, meaning the conversion, for lack of a better word, to the Roman way of life of the people in the provinces. Um, the Romans, and I, I've used this uh, metaphor with students for years, and if you've heard it before, my apologies for the repetition, but I like to say Romans were kind of like viruses. Um, without being overly pejorative or anything like that, I'm not trying to compare them to pathogens, um, but if you consider how a virus behaves... It enters a foreign body, a cell, and uh, it takes over the DNA or RNA of the cell, uh, which is responsible for replication, and it rewrites that DNA to spit out more copies of the same virus, right? Well, that's kind of what Rome did everywhere they went. They had... Uh, a specific set of structures um, and a, a kind of model or template of a city plan. And this is what they did everywhere. Um, if they built new cities, they built it along these lines. If they conquered cities that were older, um, already pre-existing, they tended to try to refashion them uh, after the Roman template. Um, uh, last In the last uh, video, we talked about the um, attempt to rebuild Jerusalem, for instance, during the time of uh, the Emperor Hadrian. Um, if we look here um, at the, uh, the city of Aelia Capitolina, which is what the Romans then called the Jerusalem they rebuilt, right? Um, the way that this is laid out uh, attempts to follow this basic template of the city plan. This is especially true with the way the streets were laid out. And, and they demolished pre-existing structures in order to pull this off. Um, not all of them, but, but many of them, right? Um, and this was also done under the auspices of, an, of the army who were stationed there. And the way that the Romans would set up their military camps also followed this basic plan. 
And so let me take you through um, the basic plan of a Roman city. And I'm going to use this um, example here, which is the Roman city of Gerasa, or as it's now called, Jerosh. And you can see that name here. Um, Gerasa was in uh, was one of this this kind of organization of cities known as the Decapolis, and the deck there indicates that there are ten of these. Uh, these were cities that were spread across the Levant region in the Near East, um, uh, in the nations of what are now Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan. Um, that's where the Decapolis cities were, and. You know, these were Greek and then Roman cities. Um, they were in some ways competitors to um, the dominant ethnic groups of the region, especially the Jewish people in Judea. And so these were populated. I mean, there were Jews living in them, but there were significant numbers of non-Jews who lived in these cities. Um, we can see in Jerash all of the major features of a Roman city as well as the way that this is laid out. It follows the basic plan. Every Roman city had a system of streets or roads. The two most important of these roads were called the Cardo and the Decumanus. Okay, The Cardo was the main north-south thoroughfare through the city. If we go back to this map of Jerash, You'll see that this is this is not laid out like we would normally lay out maps. Um, this is north, uh, this direction. This is south. This is the bottom is east and the top is west. Um, not sure exactly why this is shown that way, but whatever, right? Um, and so the Cardo was this main thoroughfare right here. It doesn't follow an exact uh, northwest or north-south um, uh, direction. Um, or actually, it might it might do that, but you know, it's pretty close, right? And, and, I mean, Roman streets did have to follow the lay of the land, uh, of course, as well. Um, so that was the main north-south drag, and, and this tended to be uh, have lots of columns along it, and all of the other main components of a Roman city were placed along the Cardo. Uh, the Decumanus was the main east-west thoroughfare through the city, and the Decumanus uh, of Jerash um, is actually not in existence anymore, but it seems to have been roughly right here. I think that this um, this thing uh, is the original Decumanus. It may have been a little bit further to the south here. Because in most Roman cities, uh, the main forum, which I'll talk about in a moment here, uh, was at the intersection of the Cardo, the Cardo Maximus, as it was called, and the Decumanus Maximus. That is the greatest streets uh, of the city, right? Maximus means the greatest. It's a superlative. Um, Cardo itself uh, is related to the, the word core, which means heart. And so the, the Cardo was the, the heart of the city. And, you know, you could probably spot Roman cities from space. You just have to look for this wide kind of main street or these intersecting main streets, the Cardo and the Decuman, the Cardo, the Cardo Maximus and the Decuman, Decumanus Maximus. Uh, if we go back uh, to that um, diagram of uh, Ilia Capitolina, you can see this, that, you know, they actually uh, had to split the Cardo because there are lots of hills and valleys and things like that in uh, Jerusalem. Um, that uh, there were, you know, the Cardo Maximus was here, but then it kind of, and then here's the Decumanus Maximus. Uh, but there was this secondary Cardo as well that ran all the way down through the city of David, um, uh, this is the Tyropian Valley here, um, I believe. Uh, so it ran through the city, it ran through this valley, whereas the, Car the Cardo Maximus ended up running into what remained the camp of the 10th Legion of Rome uh, for many, many decades after, the, after they put down the Jewish revolts. Okay, um, a second feature of pretty much every Roman city was this thing called a forum. And the forum was the main city public space. It's not a park. There were parks uh, in many cities too. Um, but it tended to be this colonnaded space, often laid out in an ellipse uh, or possibly a rectangle. Um, but this is where, this was kind of the main market of the city. It's also a place for lots of public gatherings. Um, and the forum of Jerosh is pretty obvious here uh, as you look at this shot, right? You can see the, um, the Cardo proceeding uh, to the north from there. And then the forum itself is laid out um, uh, uh, in this kind of elliptical fashion in Jerosh. 
A third feature of, of every Roman city was this thing called a hippodrome. And the hippodrome was for entertainment. Um, it was pri- the, the most uh, popular form of entertainment in the Roman Empire was um, chariot racing. And so that's the most obvious thing that would have happened here. Um, the uh, Circus Mac- Maximus um, in Rome was the kind of the big leagues of chariot racing. And, uh, you know, chariot racers or chariot uh, owners... Um, in the provinces, uh, if they won, if they did really well in the provinces, could be uh, sort of get involved in the in the kind of big leagues in Rome and and race their horses and chariots in the uh, in the Circus Maximus. But but every city had one of these, and every city had its own chariot racing teams, and these tended to imitate the way that this was set up in Rome. Uh, and so in Rome, there were four major factions, as we call them. Um, these are chariot racing teams, but they were also, um, I, I talked about the word society earlier. Um, sometimes these chariot, these, uh, chariot racing teams became almost a society as people express their loyalty to this. This could, I mean, the, the kind of fan clubs or fan bases of these, uh, chariot racing teams, uh, could become places for people to express their discontent, possibly even demonstrate or riot or something like that. Um, like I said, there were four major teams. Uh, these were named for colors, and so there were the the reds, the whites, the blues, and the greens. Um, and uh, I'm not sure why there was no yellow or purple or anything like that. Okay, I didn't uh, didn't come up with this system. Um, uh, historically, the blues and the greens were the most popular and the most successful. And so in a place like Jerash, there would have been probably a red and white and blue and green team. And, and the fan bases for these would have uh, probably cheered more broadly for you know the, the teams uh, in Rome if they were cognizant that that, that, that existed. Okay. Um, and, you know, the Romans absolutely loved chariot racing. Uh, they turned out in the hundreds of thousands for these things. Um, the race courses are each unique uh, of their own size. There wasn't a standardized size per se. Uh, they tended to decorate the, the chariot racing arenas. Um, the Cardo, or I should say the Hippodrome in Jerosh, is quite small as these things go. Um, I can't remember what the exact proportions of it are, but it's a you know, 150, 200 yards long, something like that. Maybe a little, maybe a little longer. I'm trying to recall from when I went there how big it was. I mean, it was not a a truly grand arena, but um, it probably seated you know um, tens of thousands, maybe uh, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 thousand people. Um, the Circus Maximus in Rome seated upwards of a quarter million people, and they held races there several times a week. Um, and it seems that they filled the stands. And so that's how popular this thing was. Um, so, you know, I, I could go into more detail. I've taught a whole class uh, a couple of times about sports and leisure in, in antiquity. Um, but uh, I think that that's probably good for, for, this, for our purposes here. Every Roman city had temples. Um, usually the most important temple was the temple of the patron deity. And this tended to be a grand structure, whereas other temples would have been built on a slightly smaller scale. Since this was a Greek-speaking part of the empire, all of the names are in Greek here. The patron deity of, of Jerash was Artemis, and you can see the size of the temple here. It's actually bigger than the Hippodrome. Um, this thing is massive, um, and the, the entire population of the city could easily have fit, have fit inside of this place with a lot of room to spare. And so they held public festivals and things like this. Um, as we've mentioned many times, let me just underscore the point, the Romans did not, I mean, religion was not a private thing. It's a communal thing, although there were religious forms that were increasingly private introduced into, uh, into the Roman world, and I'll talk about those um, in a later video. Um, uh, so, you know, Artemis, the Artemis Temple's the biggest and the most important, and the, one, the picture that I showed you was only the this little interior sanctuary inside of that uh, broader temple precinct. Um, but there's also a temple dedicated to Zeus um, at the south end, right off of the Cardo here. 
whereas the Artemis Temple is right in the middle of the city, um, kind of halfway down the Cardo. And um, uh, this, note that there is a cathedral here because, and several other churches, these were built after Jerosh was uh, Christianized during the Byzantine period. Um, but let's ignore those uh, things to talk about ancient Rome. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the temple was another vital structure, and the Romans took their the worship of their deities seriously. Um, they felt that the the welfare of their communities depended upon the favor of the gods. Uh, most Roman cities had another entertainment space in the form of a theater, um, though the Romans tended to like the sorts of things that were better staged in an amphitheater, which is a theater in the round. The most famous amphitheater, of course, is the Flavian Amphitheater in Rome itself, otherwise known as the Colosseum though I, I think I talked uh, in a previous video about why it's called the Colosseum. It has nothing to do with the structure itself. It was that it was built next to this uh, larger-than-life statue of Nero. Um, and this, is, this being the, the Greek-speaking East, there was a greater appreciation for Greek-style theater. And so the theaters in Jerosh, uh, there are two of them. There's one on the north end of town and one on the south end of town. Um, these are the semi-circular version of that. Um, in the West, uh, while they did build some of these uh, Greek-style theaters during the Republican period, um, they tended to be overshadowed in the Imperial period by the building of amphitheaters. Um, I was a few years ago in the city of Arles uh, in southern France, and uh, there is a Greek-style theater that was built in the second century BCE by the Romans. This, was, this would have been in uh, Transalpine Gaul, uh, the province of Transalpine Gaul, um, and it was an important city for the Romans there, um, even a kind of provincial capital, I believe. Um, but then this, uh, right next to the Greek-style theater, they built a an amphitheater, which was significantly larger. Um, and in Arles, they still have celebrations and things that happen in that, even today. Um, but uh, this is much better uh, a much better space for, you know, gladiator fights and uh, um, the other kinds of public forms of entertainment that the Romans uh, appreciated. Um, and then the last feature, and one that is arguably the most important, because this is the one they would have spent the most time in on a daily basis, was a bathhouse. Every city pretty much had a at least one public bathhouse. It would have been free for the inhabitants to go to this place, um, and this would have been maintained at the public expense, probably through via these liturgies. And so the local elites would have shelled out the money to ensure that this was in good repair, that there was uh, fuel for the furnaces that heated the water, um, that uh, the aqueduct was functioning properly and diverted uh, to the bathhouse. Um, uh, I mean, we think of aqueducts as providing fresh water for people to drink and cook with and things like this. And they did that, but the primary... Uh, the vast majority of the water probably went to the bathhouses of the cities, um, or at least a good portion of it, right? This is not a very good picture of the bathhouse. This is not the one, by the way, in Jerosh, which is in today in complete ruins. Um, you can see, if you look at that map of Jerosh, how prominent the bathhouse is and how big it is, right? I mean, this is a huge structure. And these were built on a monumental scale because they needed to accommodate hundreds, if not thousands of people, depending on the size of the city. Um, the largest of all of the baths in Rome, actually there are a couple of different, um, uh, Trajan built a, a huge bathhouse, uh, but the Severan dynasty ruler, and we haven't talked about the Severans yet, that's later this, it's in a later video this week, um, but uh, the Severan dynasty ruler Caracalla in the first half of the 3rd century built this massive structure, which is simply called the Baths of Caracalla. Um, this building and its surrounding grounds occupy about 60 acres. Um, and it's thought that um, at any given time that uh, maybe eight to 10,000 people could be in this bathhouse, though probably a, a kind of standard number would be two to three thousand, something like that, right? That's how big this is. Um, I have a map here, uh, a kind of layout of the Baths of Caracalla. You'll see that this is not just a big pool of water, right? Um, bathing was a ritual 
for Romans. We might even say that it was an art, right? Romans of whatever status tended to go to the bathhouse every day. Elite Romans would go there in the morning and stay all day because they didn't have, you know, manual labor jobs that they had to go to or anything like that. Um, they tended to uh, carry out political conversations and conduct business deals um, and even carry out illicit uh, sexual liaisons and things like that in the bathhouses, right? Um, knowing the owner or the operator of a bathhouse was a good thing because they might uh, admit you into private spaces to uh, do things that you didn't necessarily want to do in the public. But um, otherwise, I mean, the bathing itself was done communally, done publicly. And that said, the Romans were kind of prudish when it came to nudity and, and these sorts of things. They didn't uh, parade around naked in front of each other. They tended to wear some sort of loose-fitting clothing to cover up um, private parts. But, uh, um, you know, they would go there for hours a day. And in many places, there were separate... Many bathhouses had separate men's and women's facilities. There is some debate of how strictly enforced these were. Um, some bathhouses... It's not obvious uh, which part would have been women's and which part would have been men's, or if they were in fact mixed in this. The Vasicar collar are one such uh, such thing. I mean, on the one hand, uh, and the Romans appreciated symmetry, much like the Greeks did in their architecture. There are separate facilities here, right? You can see that this this side is a mirror image of this side, and um, you can take a look at the. Uh, you could pause the video here, for instance, and take a look at all of the things that exist inside of this bathhouse. Um, the bathing ritual uh, went through a strict course. Um, and so they would enter, they would start by going in, uh, checking their clothes, uh, changing into the bathing costume. Um, and, uh, you know, what we would call a swimming suit, but it was a slightly different sort of drapery. Um, and then they would probably go into this part, which is called the tepidarium. This is the 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 warm water pool. And there they would have immersed themselves and probably, you know, they didn't have soap or shampoo or anything like that. They just start by by dipping themselves and maybe relaxing in the warm water a bit. Um, uh, and then they would probably go into this round uh, facility here, which was the, um, the caldari caldarium. Uh, this is the hot room. And the water here was scalding hot. They did not actually dip themselves in this. They would sit in the steam and sweat. They felt that sweating was a, a cleansing activity. Um, and so the caladarium fulfills that function. It's really more like a sauna uh, than anything. Um, and they would take olive oil and rub it on themselves and, and then scrape uh, the dirt and the sweat and things like that with these metal hooks called striggles. Um, and then they would, uh, they also had cold water. If they got too hot, they would pour cool water over themselves. That would be available in the uh, caladarium. And then they would make their way to this facility, which was the, the um, frigidarium. This is the unheated water pool. And this would have been the kind of final step here. Um, there would have been, if they had slaves and servants, uh, they would have taken them with them and they would probably receive a massage um, and uh, some further scraping or uh, depilation. The Romans uh, tended to pluck or shave their body hair. Um, a lot of their body hair, maybe all of it, right? Um, uh, the Romans had a kind of abhorrence for body hair, it seems. Um, and then, you know, maybe spend a little time relaxing in the in the kind of uh, lukewarm water there. Um, I will say some bathhouses had a reputation for being quite dirty, and Romans express uh, some concern about this. they ancient authors who talk about, who warn uh, their fellow Romans that if you have an open wound or something like that, or even a scrape, you should probably think twice before going into the bathhouse because it's almost certainly going to get infected. I mean, they did not have chemicals to kill bacteria and things like this, and almost certainly as happens today, you know, uh, people um, may have done things to... Um, uh, soil the waters of the pool. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail about that, but uh, it's an unfortunate thing, almost certainly. Bathhouses also had other th other facilities. Um, uh, they combined the Greek style gymnasium, and so over uh, on either side here, we have these various facilities for exercise, for wrestling, for probably 
lifting weights. They had ball games that they played and things like this. Um, uh, they had performance spaces where people could go to listen to a public lecture or to hold discussions on philosophical issues. Uh, some bathhouses had libraries. Vazakarakala did, it seems, have a library. Um, you can see here number 27, where is that? Um, over here, uh, this is a, a large court, um, but then they had these separate buildings which were libraries um, and uh, and probably uh, halls, as I said, number 29, where's that? Um, halls for academic discussion, okay? Um, and so this is say. Uh, <laughs> This is a huge facility, uh, multi-purpose facility. This whole area, like I said, 60 acres of ground, and you can see how large the central bath bathing facility is. It's absolutely massive um, because this was constantly in use. It was free for inhabitants of Rome to go to this place, and they did constantly. Here's a, uh, another of the capitalist cities. Uh, this is in modern Palestine, Israel. Um, the city of Beit Shan is, is in the distance there. Um, but uh, this was ancient Scytopolis, and you can see these features here. Um, here's the, the theater. This is the Greek-style theater. Here's the Cardo, and I think this is the Decumanus down here. Um, the uh, Hippodrome is just off of the picture over here. This is the bathhouse, this whole precinct over here. And when I took this picture, I was standing uh, where the side of the temple was up on a hill, right? So all of these things along the Cardo and the Decumanus. Um, and I believe this thing we're looking at in front of us here would have been the Forum. Uh, much of the city was destroyed by earthquakes. It's a very active seismic zone. So, you know, the, you see these pillars having fallen over and this was never fully rebuilt. Um, the Romans also provided a lot of other public works. And uh, like this is a public toilet facility. This is actually in Scytopolis. Um, uh, and this, there were like a hundred or so of these little stones sticking out from the wall. And so to use this, uh, you simply perch yourself over the gap between these stones and there would have been a, a channel of running water here to carry the waste away. Um, uh, there is no separation here between men's and women's facilities, by the way. Um, and you know, elites would have had toilets and even like uh, uh, indoor plumbing um, and sometimes a whole many bathhouses in their own uh, on their own grounds um, but uh, Rome believed in providing these sorts of things to the public for free and these were done through benefactions through philanthropy uh, through taxation and, and other such things so you know we can see why uh, people were content to live under Rome they provided a lot of amenities um, this is the Ponte Guard in Southern France, this is one of the most famous aqueducts from the Roman period. Um, an aqueduct is really just a, a pipe to carry water from some kind of freshwater spring into a town, into a population center. Um, this is a, an incredible feat of engineering, and the Romans were really good at engineering. Not so interested in kind of theoretical natural philosophy or what we would call science, as the Greeks were, for instance. Uh, but by trial and error um, and craftsmanship and creativity, the Romans were able to pull off these amazing feats uh, that benefited huge swaths of the popu population, that made it possible to live in massive cities uh, and, and to actually have them be livable. That's not to say that a place like Rome or even a provincial city was a, you know, a pristine, clean place. Um, these were, you know, filthy, crowded uh, uh, sorts of areas. But on the other hand, you know, I mean, there was fresh water available to anyone who could carry it. Uh, they could go to the bathhouse. They could go and receive free entertainment via the public benefactions of the emperor of some elite Roman, right? Um, I like to show the Monty Python sketch. I won't do it here of what have the Romans ever done for us um, from the movie The Life of Brian. Um, and uh, I think that that captures the sentiment of many of the Roman subjects that, you know, maybe living under the Romans feels oppressive at times, but on the other hand, they brought the aqueduct and they, you know, have created sanitation and they've brought in improved medicine and uh, they provide baths and, you know, and they uh, have allowed for um, a 
broader uh, kind of economic network that brings goods that would have been unavailable previous to the time we were conquered by the Romans, right? So people were, if not content, at least they recognized that living under Roman rule was not always a bad thing. I think that that's all I want to say um, about this. Uh, in the next video, I want to look at the evidence from some of the texts that I assigned for this week uh, about some of the 